Welcome to Screen Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist who was telling me I had bipolar. I was sent home with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using loud music as a form of therapy. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. One of the most powerful tools for mental health is attending support groups. Whether professionally or peer-led, these groups allow people with mental health conditions to share space and time with other people who understand. This alone makes support groups a viable tool for mental health recovery and transformation. Alex Play is the guitarist of Low Heaven, a band that provides emotional release set to maximum volume. Alex grew up in the Ontario punk scene and he learned crucial lessons to carry forward both in his professional and personal life. We agree that support groups mirror the punk scene in a lot of ways. Alex's work facilitating and attending support groups is modeled on what he learned from punk. Show empathy for each other. Listen to each other. Have each other's backs. Screaming along to your favorite band in a sweaty venue or holding space for someone in a sharing circle. Either way, it's punk. My name is Alex Play. I play guitar in the band Low Heaven. The first little while of this band was very influenced by COVID and mental health being sparked everywhere through everybody. And this video that we released for the song Cancer Sleep is really reminiscent of that. We really wanted to capture some of the struggle. We try to take a little bit of a different angle with it, with some support group, community-based recovery from whatever type of standpoint. And yeah, I think it turned out really well with the uh, interpretive performance that was involved in the video. Really happy with it. So you've attended some support groups, you've helped people with learning how to facilitate them, and you've also done some facilitating yourself. Support groups, in a lot of ways, are mirroring the punk scene because you're there to support each other and there's a chance for everybody to kind of give their peace. and Definitely. I think you're bang on with that. The community aspect of recovery from most mental health issues really comes down to what type of community recovery can take place. I'm in mental health recovery myself. I'm fully open with disclosure and all this. You know, I'm in recovery from alcoholism and assorted other mental health issues. I myself have attended a variety of different types of community support groups, meetings and things like that. And uh, I think it was the factor that uh, helped me go from being sick to being in recovery. I think this video was really trying to push that a little bit, that narrative a little bit, because I, I agree, like the punk scene, whatever music scene is really dependent on each other, uh, which is very much the same as a lot of mental health recovery. There's definitely things that we can do on our own that are super beneficial to do with the punk scene. Like I can practice and play guitar in my room for forever, but there is something different that happens when we get together and we play music together. We get to open up and be vulnerable together. We get to dive in deep with some things that necessarily wouldn't feel comfortable to dive in deep without a bunch of other people going, yes, let's do this together. Going from point A to point B is a really difficult thing. 
having other people to do it with that are all on the same page that are actively having each other's backs to do it makes the whole thing so much easier and more viable for the long-term engagement of recovery. I'm visualizing this now and thinking, maybe have not thought about this entirely before, but someone's up there on stage and they're screaming their hearts out and they're going through this therapeutic, well, scream therapy, and people are watching them and listening to them. And it's almost like when you pass the conch in a support group where each person has their say and their time to share, and then we move on to the next. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Obviously, when a band is playing, the band has the conch, right? The band is the one that's speaking at that point. But in a lot of different support group style things, there are two different types of these meetings that take place. You know, there's the close where everybody gets a chance to share and it's passed around consistently. And then there's the other type where it's one person is at the front sharing their big story to engage everybody else in it. Both have their places and their importances, and one isn't better than the other. They're both just different experiences. I know, and I'm sure everybody else that listens and has been a part of the punk scene as well knows just how important it is to be able to go to see a band that you love and experience the emotion that's coming through that. And scream therapy, like, you know, I go to concerts all the time, as I'm sure most of your listeners do. When my favorite band is up singing my favorite song, and I'm in the audience and I'm screaming everything back at them, it is one of the most therapeutic experiences that you can have. And that's not me sharing my stuff. That's me sharing my interpretation of somebody else's therapeutic release, whatever that might be. I think that's a a really beautiful thing that it happens consistently in our world of the punk world, but it's uh, not something that really gets focused on. It's something that we've kind of taken for granted for a long time. And then COVID came along and everything got shut down. And a couple of years before COVID, like the scene, at least here in Toronto, I'm sure it was everywhere, but everything was slowing down hard. Everybody kind of was in their own heads, being super busy. You know, inflation was happening. Everything's way more expensive than it should be. Life is, was and still continues to be getting hard. So now it seems like shows are packed all the time. People are coming back hard to engaging in what feels good. And it feels good to be with other people that are you know, in the same mindset going, I want to go have fun tonight. I want to release. I want to be engaged with community and hang out with my friends, yell real loud and you know, mosh and whatever. I've had people in my support group that have told me that it's, I think you mentioned this too, one of the most beneficial things in their mental health transformation, one of the best things in their wellness plan. And it's really amazing to hear that when it's a fully volunteer thing and it still is but to have over 350 members on our list now wow. getting a steady 30 people a week or whatever it is is pretty amazing you've been a participant in these support groups and i'm wondering how they are beneficial to you it's the same thing that i've talked about uh, the community aspect i'm a therapist and i work in a treatment center and i talk to people that are struggling actively coming into treatment, they don't have a direction. It's just pain was taking place. I don't know what to do. So please provide me with an answer. And so the answer that I provide mostly in support of this community-based recovery is uh, I use this analogy with the movie 300. In the movie 300, there is these 300 soldiers that are facing you know millions and millions of other people that are trying to come and uh, take over their land or whatever. Their whole strategy is that they have each other's backs hard consistently, no gap whatsoever. Their shields go up together and they have this momentum of shields go up, spears are up and they move their shields apart, attack, come together, impenetrable defense. And then there's this character that comes in. He's trying to show off his spear work and like, can I join the 300? He does and he's got the most amazing spear work out of anybody that's had spear work and whatever, best there could be. But he's got an inability to raise his shield because his left shoulder doesn't work properly. And so Leonidas, the leader of the 300, says, like, I'm sorry, you can't join us. One of the main reasons why we're successful is because we consistently have each other's backs, no matter what. If somebody gets hurt, we fill that gap immediately. And that's very much how I see the recovery community, because with mental health recovery, regardless of what we may be recovering from, 
Steve-O from Jackass puts it very elegantly. He says that I, as somebody with mental health, can't trust myself consistently 100% of the time. But if there's 10 of us or 20 of us in a group that all have agreed, we have the same mental health issue and we want to get to this goal. We are going in this direction where we would like to be healthy and happy and et cetera, et cetera. I can be much more confident in the group being able to call me out. If I'm starting to stray and go, oh, actually, I want to go and have a drink. This seems to be more viable for me. I'm going to go and have an outburst or I'm going to isolate or whatever. I'm going to have 19 other people around me that are going, no, we agreed. Let's go this way. The 300 analogy of we are impenetrable together, but alone, my power is only so great. And the accountability of it. Yeah, Some people totally. show up week to week and they're just there to be accountable and they're just there to show other people that they're there. And sometimes that can yeah. be enough. We also have people on our list that haven't come in two years of being on the list, but then they'll email me and say, so much appreciate the fact that you send it every, every week and I know that it's there in case I, I need it. So people out there that actually do understand in some regard, no one's ever going to understand someone completely, but it's just that feeling of comfort. And yeah, I'm really interested in the fact that you're running the groups yourself and as a therapist, because that's a different scenario than doing it peer to peer like I do. Yeah. I mean, it's different, but it's not. As a clinician, I'm more of a, I'm facilitating. I am the leader of this group and I'm going to navigate it in the way that I see fit. But I very much take my influence of what pathways to take from my experience in support groups of my own. Those lines get blurred a little bit, which doesn't sound great as a clinician, but it does. When I'm facilitating a group, I think I also have to be a part of that group. I can't just be a facilitator and aiming it in certain ways. I think there's a certain element that I've found necessary for myself anyway in those groups where like I have to be a part of it. Yes, I'm technically the leader, but also I'm opening up and sharing and getting vulnerable, leading by example type of thing instead of just leading. Yeah, and that inspires me to share more myself because I'm always cognizant of the time that we have and the kind of person that I am is I'm going to let someone else go first and you know, sacrifice my own time. Yeah. Maybe tell me a little bit about how your involvement in the punk scene inspired or influenced your work that you do now. You know, I've been playing in bands since I was like 13 years old. Early high school, I have started playing and I was definitely drawn to the community there as, you know, a young person that didn't really have a direction to go in of, you know, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I was definitely drawn to a community that was overly accepting. I grew up in Oakville, so Southern Ontario, the hardcore scene and things like that. It was very like, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, anything. It's just, if you want to come and hang out, let's hang out and go to a show together. Every single show, every band would always say, if somebody falls, pick them up. That's the number one rule. I never saw anybody get really hurt. Like there was obviously going to be some people that got hit in the face, I was overtly accepting. And so for a young kid that was looking for an identity and looking for a direction to go in of like, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but these people seem super cool and they're accepting of me and I can go there and feel like I'm a part of something that is bigger than myself. There's people there that will actively go out of their way to help me if I'm struggling. That really resonated with me as a young person. And that became like a big part of my identity. And up throughout my early 20s, even, I really didn't know what I wanted to do until I was 26, 27. Yes, I struggled with mental health and addiction issues for that whole time because the direction that I had was very like, I don't know. But I always had the music scene to rely on. It was always who do I know? Why wouldn't they want to come with me and go and enjoy this fun thing that I'm going to do? So I was always very much like the rallying point for my friend group. Let's go and do this thing. If you don't know them, that's cool. Come and hang out because I think you'll love it. And people did. I had a group of like 15 people that we would just go places and do stuff, mostly in the music scene. I've always thought some people get it and some people don't. And I've wondered a lot about that. You can go to a house show and some people are there because they're right in the front and they want to be as close as they can to the singer or, or the guitar player, even pushing through and being close to the drummer sometimes. 
some people just hang out outside and that's you're happy to do that. And I'm not saying one or the other is better. I think they're both really great. But there's also folks that just want nothing to do with it. And I'm not sure what that is. With mental health, there's a very firm line of like either you get it or you don't get it. The one side that doesn't get it, that tries to get it, you know, if you've never experienced something personally like addiction or bipolar or whatever, it's really difficult to stand in somebody's shoes, regardless of how hard you try to be in those shoes. Like those experiences are very difficult to explain to somebody else. What is a craving? What is a mood shift that's taking place that's of that grand a scale? Those things are very almost impossible to explain to somebody else that hasn't been in those shoes. But the beautiful thing about the music scene is like, it really is a choice. You can be a part of it or you can choose not to be a part of it. And if you're interested even a little bit, you can kind of go and regardless if it's a house show with eight people there or you're going to Scotiabank Arena, you can go and you can feel that same camaraderie and like, we're here to do this and we're doing it together. And there's beauty in that that's kind of undeniable and in the recovery world there's kind of this thing where like we don't really have to identify with each other of oh you've been through something i've been through something too and that's the extent of the explanation that we have to go through with each other and going to a punk show going to any type of music event people can go and feel that if they're looking for it There's people that can go and be like, I don't get it. I hate this. I'm going to leave right now. But if they're actively looking for it, it's pretty apparent. And yeah, it's a beautiful thing to have such an open and accessible community that's so loving. In the Scream Therapy book, I posed the question of whether I found punk rock or if punk rock found me. Had I not met a certain person or come across a certain band at a show or if I had not stumbled sometimes upon that I think sometimes folks just kind of stumble in like oh my god this is what I've been looking for and I'm wondering what your experience was with that that's like an impossible question to answer did I find this or did it find me I'm somebody that really believes in spirituality I guess you could call it not in a way of like I believe in crystals or auras or things like that per (laughs) se (laughs) but like I believe in the power of the universe in a way that like Regardless of if we were looking for it or not, it would have found us. That's not to say that I didn't actively go out and seek it, because I think I did at one point. Like one of the earliest shows I can remember going to was like one of the bigger shows I remember going to was Hamilton. I think it was at the convention center and there was a bunch of local but bigger local bands like Protest the Hero. And it was like a a super lineup for my age group (laughs) you know my scene that i was going to see like those were everybody that i was interested in i remember being there and i was too inexperienced to be able to go in and like mosh appropriately or at that time appropriately and engage in the scene the way that i would want to later on but everybody was so accepting and so loving there everybody was having such a great time it was such a life-changing experience my friends and i stayed after the show We didn't even really purposely do anything to hang out with anybody, but a bunch of the band members just made their way over to us. We were like, you know, young high school kids that were there and we got to talk to them and they were like, you know, I was in my first band and I was like, oh, I'm playing at the Reverb down the street in a week. And a bunch of them were like, they were super nice. They're like, oh, sorry, we're on tour. We can't come to your show. But as a 13 year old kid, I was like, wow, protest the hero said that they would like to come to my show if they could even though now, of course, they weren't going to do it. They were just making me feel better. (laughs) But the impact that that had on me, I dove in hard. I spent every dollar I had on their merch. The band that I've seen the most in my life is Protest the Hero because of that interaction that I had. I've seen them like 19 or 20 times just because every time they played anywhere locally, I went to see them because they had such a profound impact on me. This song's about how I fought a dragon and won. It's called Nautical.
yes, I went out to seek it, but I didn't know what I was seeking. I just knew that I was seeking some sort of community, some sort of image that I wanted to be a part of. And it, I don't know, it was a beautiful thing. The whole scene, everything to do with this is incredible. And I really am seeing like a resurgence of it after COVID taking place. And it's really exciting that Low Heaven gets to be a part of that. With someone like you who grew up in the punk scene and is sensitive to all the things that you just mentioned, is a perfect person to be doing therapy and doing a support group leading and even attending a support group because you have that empathy and you have that you're able to put other people in front of you at least for a short time and you're a listener and all these things that I think were part of the punk scene there's always going to be dummies that show up and they're not listening and they're not being empathic and all those things you're going to mm -hmm. have that but I think with people like you and me being reared on that really has helped I know for me my life going forward and I often wonder too if I hadn't been into punk rock and been so strong-willed, how would my journey have been since being diagnosed and even struggling all those years and staving off my crisis by using music and punk rock and the people around me to lift me up until they couldn't anymore? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, that means a lot. It's one of the reasons why I started doing this is because I knew I had a place in the scene per se. I knew I wanted to be a part of this anyway, and there's no real guidelines of who gets to be a part of it. It's just, if you say you're in, you're in. And so I took that. And when I was you know, struggling with my own mental health and it came to a crisis point, it was like, what do I do with my life? Going into a place where I was able to connect with other people and share my experience and people actively held out their hands for me and said, oh, you need help. I can help you. I took it upon myself to, I felt like I owed it to, again, like the universe, whatever you want to call it. I love what I do. I love being a part of this and helping people. It's a selfish thing because I feel good from helping other people. And uh, that's a, a weird dichotomy of concepts there, but it does. It makes me feel good to be a part of this. And like recovery is about, and I don't think this gets talked about enough, but recovery from whatever we're recovering from is about having a good life. I want to feel good. I want to enjoy the interactions I have with other people. I want to be okay when I'm alone in my bedroom at night going to sleep. Like I want to have a good experience while being on this planet. It really takes some external direction sometimes to be able to accomplish that because anybody that's struggled with any type of level of mental health has gone through the thought patterns of, uh, you know, pretty generally anyways, of I want this, but I can't get that. I tried everything possible to figure out how to stop drinking and how to stop being depressed and how to stop having anxiety. And everything just led me to having it be the exact same or worse. And so only when I started to look outwards and go like, where can I get some direction? Has somebody been through this before? Can they help me with it? Was I able to get somewhere with it? And now through recovery, as I'm sure you'd agree, life's way better on this side, being part of something bigger than myself. This is a semantics language thing, and there's a lot of stuff in the book, especially near the end of it, where I start to look at language around mental health. And one of the really cool things that uh, Sasha De Bruel said to me, he's uh, the person that co-founded the Icarus Project and was in some bands like Choking Victim. And he was talking about the language of transformation. And the idea of recovery is a word that we use a lot. And of course, it's a beautiful thing to recover from something. But he was saying that the word transformation implies that, you know, you're moving from one place and into the next rather than trying to get back to your recovery or to regain your health. And I really like that idea of, you know, I'm a totally different person now than I was before my diagnosis, since my diagnosis. I could have a relapse and be a different person again. And this whole idea mm -hmm. of navigating this windy road and with hopefully getting into a straight road ahead, that's a road that's going to a good place. Yeah, that's something that I really struggled with. And I know a lot of other people seem to struggle with as well is the idea of, well, I'm this way now, but I can remember being all right back at some point. So like, how do I get back to that version of myself? That didn't help me because that version of myself that I was romanticizing was the version of myself that turned into the version of myself that almost died a bunch of times. I can take elements of who I am, but also recovery becomes about who do I want to be? What would I envision myself ideally being? 
you know, we left our video very much up into interpretation to bring it all back to what we talked about at the beginning. We had the interpretive dancer there. He's a good friend of ours. His name is Justin. His interpretive dance was very much this internal struggle of being in a place where change is happening actively, but there's also a struggle just to be there in that environment. At some points, you can see in the video where everybody's calm and just in a circle and it's just a community meeting. And then there's parts where everybody starts to get more and more uncomfortable and he does his dance. The way that he's able to express emotion through his movements is uh, pretty incredible. It's very reminiscent of what I think a lot of people go through of, well, I am this version of me right now in the present. I only know this other version of myself from before to compare it to. And so, yes, I want to be that, but also there's that understanding that like that version of myself turned into this. The unknown of this future version of ourselves is terrifying. There's a lot more that we purposely left open to interpretation, but I think that's how I interpret it. The fear and the struggle I'm trying to recover now, what does that look like? That was my conversation with Alex Play of Low Heaven, lowheavenband.bandcamp.com. For more episodes of Screen Therapy, go to screentherapyhq.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. Big news, the Screen Therapy book is available now. Screen Therapy, a punk journey through mental health, tells my story and the stories of others who use punk as a catalyst for mental health. Like this podcast, it links the community-minded punk scene with the mental wellness of the punks who belong to it. To order the book, go to ScreenTherapyHQ.com. For merch, check out the newly opened store at ScreenTherapyHQ.com slash store. And for even more designs, check out Screen Therapy on TeePublic. Okay, enough promoting. It's time for some thanking. Thank you for listening to Screen Therapy. Doing this podcast and talking to folks about punk rock and mental health has been a crucial part of my own mental stability, and it means so much to me that you're out there listening. Screen Therapy is created in the Cathet region of coastal British Columbia, Canada, on the traditional territory of the Klahaman Nation. Contact me at ScreenTherapyHQ.com or email me at ScreenTherapyPodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Let's talk about punk rock and mental health. Until next time, take care and be well.